Welcome back to Unit D. In this set of videos, we'll be looking at ways that we can perform calculations for non-ideal gases. So, since no gases are really ideal gases, why do we spend so much time studying that? Well, because a lot of gases are close enough for the level of calculation that we're wanting to do. They're close enough to being an ideal gas. Now, as pressure goes to zero, the gas molecules get farther and farther apart. And as the temperature increases, the activity of the atoms and constituent components of the atoms um, increases. And so the molecules are not paying attention to the molecules around them, which is part of what it takes to be an ideal gas. Now, a true ideal gas is going to be a molecule that takes up no space, so the smallest volume possible, and is perfectly spherical and totally oblivious, does not pay any attention to any of the other molecules around it. Okay, That's going to be an ideal gas. It's going to turn out that that's going to be more or less true when we have substances that have small molecules, so those you know, diatomic gases, O2, N2, those are going to be really good. Or other small things that tend to cluster into spherical shapes. So CH4 has the H's that all balance nicely around it. Those are going to be pretty good when the pressures are fairly low and the temperatures are fairly high. Now, how high, how low? Well, the basic rule says that the error is going to be less than 1%, and usually I'm pretty good with less than 1% error. If I have a diatomic molecule and I calculate the ideal gas specific volume, just using RT over P, and that is a value larger than 5 liters per mole, and for other molecules I'm going to have a stricter guideline, I want a specific volume greater than 20 liters per mole. And in those cases, I can expect for this to be within 1% of the answer. So that's going to be very close. So typically, we can assume air, oxygen, nitrogen, methane. We'll often also do CO2. It's not quite as good. It's got a little bit more of a linear shape. Uh, but those will be things that can be fairly adequately described as an ideal gases as long as they're at near ambient conditions, near room temperature and pressure. For other gases, if when I use the ideal gas law, I can really create some significant errors. So we have other equations of state. Now you're going to see that people get really tired of writing out equation of state. So EOS stands for equation of state. The virial equation of state is one that's based on statistical mechanics theory. Basically, this, you know, people observe that molecules actually have volume and they aren't spherical and they have attractions to one another or they're repulsed by one another. And so the virial equation of state is a modification of the ideal gas law to correct these various pieces here. And it's based on theory and statistics. You'll learn more about that in, say, a physical chemistry course. The empirical equation of states are going to be ones that are based on fitting curves to the actual data. Generally, these are a form that imitates the more theoretical equations of state, the virial or others. One of the most well-known of the empirical equation of state category is the Benedict Webb Rubin equation of state, which is a model of, or is based on the model of the virial equations of state. The cubic equations of state, the cubic EOS, is probably the most frequently used category. Uh, it's an expansion of the ideal gas law that accounts for these observed physical effects. The first one to do this was van der Waals. Um, and for well over 100 years, the van der Waals equation of state has sort of been the first really good improvement on the ideal gas law. Now, 
many, many others have been improved, have improved upon that, but that was sort of the first one. These are called cubic equations of state because when you multiply out the equation algebraically, they do form a third order polynomial. Now the virial equation of state is the one that's based on statistical mechanics theory. The terms are based on observations of how molecules truly behave because of their size, their shape, their attraction to one another. The base form of the virial equation of state is a series of terms that take the form a constant, but that constant varies with temperature, over v to the nth power for n going from zero to infinity. Now, the reality is the theory hasn't gone out that far to infinity, uh, but the first few terms are fairly well known and characterized for a few substances. The empirical equation of state is the one that's based on a curve fit to actual data. Generally, the selective form that mim mimics the theoretical ones and the one that's most well known is the Benedict Webb Rubin. Uh, I see that it's almost impossible to read. The colors didn't transfer over very well. So the form for the Benedict Webb Rubin is essentially this. And in that case, we have up to the v to the fifth term, and the constants can be found in certain data books. The cubic equations of states are the ones where they took the form of the ideal gas law and started making adaptations for physical uh, observations. So the van der Waals equation of state is the one that's shown right here. The equation starts as P equals RT over V, essentially, but then we have a minus B thrown into that denominator. So if you first look at just this portion of it, P equals RT over V minus B, what you'll notice is that there's a correction here for the fact that the molecule takes up space. Okay, so that's really what the minus B portion is there. If you then look at the next little piece, you add in a over v squared, or negative a over v squared. And this is based to, on the fact that the molecules have this attractive repulsion quality to them. So the basic form is fairly simple. It's not that different than the ideal gas law, but we have these two constants, a and b. Now, there's an observation that is going to make a little bit more sense when we get to chapter 6, but they all all curves have one point in common. They all go through something called the critical point. Okay, The critical point is the highest temperature and pressure where two phases can coexist. And again, we'll talk more about this in chapter 6. So the critical temperature is going to be designated T sub C, the critical pressure P sub C. And if the substance must pass through this critical point, it turns out that the values for A and B may, can be predicted for the van der Waals equation of state. A is 27 R squared, critical temperature squared, divided by critical pressure, and B is R times the critical temperature over 8 and the critical pressure. So these are based on the observation that this equation can only be true if these hold, okay? Now, theoretically, that works great. Physically, it's not too horrible, but there have been many improvements. The first one of these is the suave red Kwong equation of state. Um, suave red Kwong is a little bit more complicated. The P equals RT over V minus B remains the same, but the other term is more complex. There's an alpha and an A in the numerator and then V over V plus B instead of a simple V squared in the denominator. 
A and B have a form similar to what's used for the van der Waals. The numbers change a little bit because the complexity of the math. But the alpha is 1 plus m times 1 minus t over t c to the 0.5 power, the entire quantity squared. And m is equal to this expression right here. 0 0.48508 plus 1.55171 omega minus 0 0.1561 omega squared, where omega is the Pitzer acentric factor. So this one also takes into account that a molecule that is very round is going to have a zero acentric factor, and the more off round they get, or you know, maybe you have something that's bent, okay, then omega is going to change appropriately. And so the Suave Red Lit Quang takes into account the non sphericity of those. <laughs> that word that I just said was sphericity. How spherical is the sub is the molecule.